Monday is usually our real estate day, but we have houses to show you that cannot wait a week. Inside our billionaires and real housewives, art on the wall and cooks in the kitchen. Welcome to Off Duty, I'm Wendy Bounds. Now this may be the closest we ever get to politics on this show. Sorry guys. John Huntsman Jr. He ran for the GOP nomination for president earlier this year. He dropped out. His dad, however, John Huntsman Sr., he's loaded. And he's got one of the most spectacular homes in America, this according to the man himself. Check it out. Billionaire John Huntsman Sr. is the owner of this Park City, Utah retreat that spans 22,000 square feet and sleeps 44 people. At the time I built it, I was worth several billion dollars net worth, and I wanted to build a home that was the most exclusive in America. The founder of chemical maker Huntsman Corporation purchased the more than 60-acre property in the 1980s. The house took three years to build and was constructed using timber reclaimed near Yellowstone National Park. The property includes a one-mile trail and a private pond. Huntsman estimates he put more than $100 million into the home and that he spends $1 million a year on upkeep. I've always wanted the biggest the best. People are just in awe when they see the inside, the outside, and how it's built. There are 12 bedrooms, including two bunk rooms, each with 10 beds, and 16 bathrooms. Amenities include a great room with a large stone fireplace and a formal dining room that seats 20. The home also includes an indoor pool, a fitness center, a game room, and a media room. There are also several garages, including a 22-car garage that once housed Huntsman's car collection of Ferraris, Mercedes, and more. The house was initially built as a mountain retreat for Mr. Huntsman's nine children, including former Republican presidential candidate John Huntsman Jr. and their families. But the house was only used occasionally over the years. Mr. Huntsman and his wife live primarily in Idaho, where they're building a resort. The property is being offered for $49.5 million with Sotheby's International Realty. We have drawn the line at that price. I, I don't need the money, it's just the fact that it's such a beautiful place. It's really one of a kind for somebody who wants a, a beautiful mountain retreat. Now, last week we talked about how to buy art, and this week, Kelsey Hubbard, she's going to help us hang it after the bills are paid. Where should we put it? Over the fireplace? Maybe in the bathroom? So many options. So you bought your first piece of art or perhaps you're adding to your collection. We want to make sure you're displaying it and caring for it in the proper way. I'm Kelsey Hubbard and I'm here with Andrea Cashman from the Andrea Rosen Gallery in New York. And a lot of people might not think about, well, the sun's streaming in or I have it in a certain uh, humidity in my house. And these things are really important when you're dealing with artwork. So what should people know in terms of displaying and taking care of their pieces of art? The first thing to know is that, you know, most artists will have also thought of that too. Um, and so, you know, if there are any sort of conservation issues or special attention that needs to be paid to the work, the gallery will already be well versed in that. But generally, the artist is making choices um, that will ensure the preservation of work over time. Um, in terms of framing, very often an artist will have a specific frame in mind um, because it's essentially part of the work and uh, the proportions and, um, you know, the color, the width, everything everything like that, uh, it, you know, is, is an important decision made by the artist. So generally, very often, you won't actually have to make that choice It'll yourself. It'll come framed. It, exactly. So it goes with the piece as the artist intended. Exactly. The gallery will always be happy to recommend a framer um, and, you know, suggest to you, should it be framed under UV plexi, is that necessary so that the sun doesn't damage the work? And, um, you know, it, it, that's always a good question to ask and to feel comfortable asking. Now, I'm sure people buy a piece of artwork, let's say this for example, has blue in it and they want to then design a room around a certain piece of art that they buy. Uh, but what if they're adding to a room already? I mean, does that come into play to people ask you questions about that? Say, I already have uh, this uh, type of decor in my home, in the room that I plan to you know, display this piece of art. And does that come into play? Should people consider that? Uh, I mean, I think it certainly does come into play. I can't say that it's my favorite approach to collecting. My favorite collectors are those who see a piece of art love it and figure out a place to put it. It may not mean that it sort of uh, matches the, the sofa, but it's certainly you know something we can always talk about and um, sometimes someone will say, I need a painting in this size. You know, my client really loves, you know, thick oil impasto. Do you have anything that they might like? And you know, that may be something that we can find them certainly. But my, my 
favorite approach to collecting is those people who, as I said, collect what they love, fall in love with it, and usually find a place to, to make it fit. So should people be taking into consideration the size of their space that they're going to display the art in, as well as how they display it? I think certainly, uh, especially in New York, it's a, it's a concern for all of us and um, you know, we'd all love to have more wall space, so to speak, so um, you know, it's definitely something to take into consideration, particularly for someone who actually wants to live with their work. There are some people that have an issue with space and you know, they, they may have a storage space and rotate uh, the, the artwork in and out of their home. Otherwise, you know, it is a, a situation in which uh, you know, I've had to hoist a painting through a window in New York. I mean, there's certainly those kind of things where someone falls in love with something. It's hard to get into the home, but we try our best to find a way to make it happen. And who says good food isn't an art form? I'm betting that Kitty Greenwald would say that it is. She is back this week with a spectacular looking orange salad. Let's see how she made it. Hi, I'm Kitty Greenwald and this is Slow Food Fast. Today we're making a recipe for navel orange salad with herbs, feta, and arugula. So thank you, Matt Dillon. It's a really simple recipe with exotic spices that comes together really quickly. Without further ado, over low heat, we're going to toast the anise seed and the coriander. You sort of want to be standing by and give them plenty of space in the pan. So while those toast, I'm going to assemble the other ingredients. A half teaspoon red pepper flakes. You need a third of a cup chopped almonds, which I just toasted until they sort of darken in color. All right, so I'm gonna chop up the almonds. It's just a rough chop. Toasting them brings out their flavor, same thing it does for the spices. Add that in. And you want a teaspoon kosher salt. Here we have a third of a cup of picked parsley leaves. Same thing with oregano leaves. They smell really nice. Toss that in. So this is done now. This is my mortar and pestle. You just crush it. This helps sort of release their flavor. So it's a fair amount of aromatics in here. Now you're gonna crumble three ounces of feta. The better the feta, the better your salad. Add that in. I'm gonna whisk three quarters of a cup olive oil with two tablespoons red wine vinegar. You pour it over and while that marinates, you prep your oranges. We have heirloom navel oranges. Go with what's best. You can do a variety, so you can use sort of pretty cara caras and blood oranges. You can mix it up. So it's sort of the meat of the dish. And so you remove the peel of four oranges. Okay, I'll show you how you slice it. You wanna cut each into about six slices. You can serve this in a platter or you can plate each one individually. You have your dressing, which is all sort of nice and wet. Some extra feta in there. Get a nice mix. Scatter some arugula leaves and then drizzle some olive oil over top. The anise seed and the coriander are sort of in the background and the crunch. The oregano and the parsley make it more delicate. It's really, really good. Enjoy. And now back to those houses that I was telling you about. Do you fancy the Hamptons? Well, one of the real housewives of New York City, she's selling her East Hampton digs. Let's head out to the beach and take a look. Kelly Killerin Ben Simone, the former star of the Real Housewives of New York City, put her East Hampton, New York home on the market for $8 million. The interior of the two-story home has vaulted ceilings with wood beams and a stainless steel kitchen that opens up to a spacious family room with a fireplace. French doors on the main level open up to the outdoors, which includes a heated pool and a pond. The house, which appeared a few times on the Bravo TV show, spans 5,800 square feet and has five bedrooms and five and a half bathrooms. Household items such as the sheets and cups are embellished with 125, which is the numbered address for the home. The property was listed in January for $12 million, but the price was reduced less than a month later. Now, we still have a little time before St. Patty's Day, but that doesn't mean you can't start celebrating. And fortunately, we have Elva Ramirez, and she is going to show us how to make the perfect Irish whiskey cocktail.
That's it for today's WSJ Off Duty. I hope you'll click above to subscribe. Please join me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Wendy Bounds, and I'll see you back here tomorrow when I'll be learning from the experts some pearls of wisdom on how you shuck oysters the proper way. I'll see you then.